Hello, hello. Welcome, people. I'm Josh Human from The Power Plant. Just waiting as more people join us. And... Uh, welcome. Um, just trying to make sure that I have Sean Hunt here with whom we will be speaking as part of this field trip uh, program. And before too, too long, um, again, my name is Josh Human. Hi there, there he is. Hi, Hi Josh. there. How are you, Sean? I'm doing well, thanks. Excellent, excellent. We're just, uh, you know, waiting for some, some more people to join us here. Okay. Um, I love the, the way Instagram allows us to triangulate between where I am in Toronto and where you are in Vancouver and where That's all it. of our viewers are. Yes, technology is a wonder. I, I tell all my young colleagues, I remember life before the internet and before <laughs> cell phones. Yeah, and, no uh, and I don't feel that old, but... You know, I know, I, guess... I know, but I, I clearly remember a time before before all of this. And uh, I it... it I don't know. I, I can't even get used to it. Like, I can't believe it. this is this is weird to me. <laughs> it is very strange. But uh, but I love the technology. The last time uh, we met was way back at Art Toronto. Yeah. Uh, when you were here, you had a solo booth. Um, <clears throat> I will say I was just I mean, just talking with you about your work was so fascinating for me in, in lots of different ways. Um, but uh, but we'll get into that. Um, so for our online audience, um, yep. we'll sort of start more formally. Okay. Um, my name is Josh Human. I'm the curator of education and public programs at the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery in Toronto. Uh, and this is a field trip program, a conversation with artist Sean Hunt. Um, Sean is a Hildsuk artist born in Waglisla. Did I yep. pronounce that correctly? Yep. Yeah, Waglisla, uh, which is commonly known uh, as Bella Bella in British Columbia. And his practice is directly informed by his Scottish, French, and First Nations background and the visual culture and traditions that accompany it. He works with traditional Northwest Coast design principle known as Formline to create abstract, surreal, and sculptural artworks based on ancestral Hildsuk cosmology. Uh, Hunt is always seeking to push the boundaries of the art form, often combining non-traditional ideas with innovative uses of materials and motifs in his work. And his work has been exhibited throughout Canada, including solo shows at the Odain Art Museum, Vancouver Art Gallery, the Burrard Arts Foundation. And in 2011, Hunt was awarded the BC Creative Achievement Award for First Nations Art. So welcome, Sean. Thank you. Officially. Thank you very much. Um, so as I was saying, um, you know, I was so uh, fascinated to, to meet you and talk with you about your work at Art Toronto. And of course, when this field trip <clears throat> program came about, really as a cross-Canada collaboration of now well over 40 organizations, um, <clears throat> the first thing I thought was how amazing for an organization like the Power Plant in Toronto to be able to use technology to reach out and talk with artists all around the country. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then as chance would have it, all four of our fall programs as part of Field Trip are artists who are in and around the Vancouver area. So, um, so thank you to you and your fellow Vancouverite, British Columbians. Um, <clears throat> so I figured we'd start off with, you know, that magic question that a lot of people have of artists, which is, you know, what, what really led you to become an artist and how did you, how did you choose or how do you choose the media with which you work? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's like, it's a question that like, I guess I made the formal decision to become an artist in, I think second year college, I decided to go into the studio art program at Capilano college and I decided, yeah, I'm going to go for this, but I'm going to, in saying that, like I 
really, there wasn't going to be any, anything else for me. My dad's an artist and um, I've been making art my whole life. I just didn't really realize that it was a career. I just, just always did it and always had fun with it. And like, even through like I'm, I'm elementary school, high school, and even university, I just drew the whole time. I just did drawings the entire time. So, so to answer your question, I, I did, I do remember a time where I was like, yeah, I'm going to go for this. But uh, in, in saying that, I, when I look back on my life, there really wasn't a choice for me. This was what I was going to be doing there. You I were never, no, this is it. This you were never going to be like an accountant. This. What's that? Or a, you were never going to be like an accountant or a doctor or anything like that. I'm allergic to numbers. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then as far as the mediums go, um, again, like, so, so my, my chosen mediums were like, I started in jewelry and, 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 but I trained as a sculptor. Uh, um, so I trained in sculpture and drawing and, um, and now I do mainly sculpture and painting. And so how that came about is, um, so I went to school, trained as a sculptor, did a lot of drawing, a lot of sculpture. And then when I came out of school, um, like many artists, I was broke and, you know, moved back home to my parents' house. And luckily my dad was an artist. And so I just picked up his tools and he taught me how to carve jewelry. And that was the beginning for me really in, in my art career was I started carving jewelry and I did that like incessant i just did it i was crazy about it I, I did a day and night for like four or five years and, and were you using wood or metal no, i was using gold and silver and then and, um, silver. and then um I, I developed like in doing that and going so crazy about it i developed a neck problem and uh, so i had to kind of quit doing jewelry and i thought well what's something i can do because i can't just carve all the time i need another outlet and mm -hmm. um and so i thought just kind of on a whim I was like well maybe painting like I don't know how to paint I've never taken painting I've never been exposed to painting my dad isn't a painter um and so I thought I could do this and so I started painting and uh yeah I, I didn't really know much about painting I was mostly just filling in my designs with color and uh then I met um Lawrence Paul Yochlopton and he invited me to come work with him and he taught me a bunch of stuff about painting so I worked with him for uh, almost four years, I guess. Great. <clears throat> yeah. And so I'll, I'll say in addition to, to, uh, to Paul, um, who, were, who were other artists that you were sort of like looking at and interested in when you were a student growing up you yeah. know, and even now? Well, when I was like, when I was like a young, young child, um, I was really into surrealism. And I was, you know, it was all about, you know, Dali and Magritte and, and that just, that stuff just blew my mind. And, and then when I, you know, started to get into um, to, to, to native art, uh, which because I, you know, I was starting to gravitate towards that. And, uh, you know, I was looking at like all the guys that are of my dad's generation. Um, so most, you know, born around that 1946 era, like I really was inspired by those guys big time because mm -hmm. I for the first time I saw um, native art being approached in a way that was like art. So, you know, it still mm -hmm. had all those cultural underpinnings and stuff like that just get carried through with it, obviously. But these guys, um, and I'm talking about like Robert Davidson, Dempsey Bob, uh, you know, Bo Dick's a bit younger, but um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Joe David, uh, Jim Hart, you know, uh, again, yeah, a bit younger, but, um, and guys like Bill Reed, a little bit older. But those mm -hmm. guys for me um, really like took the art form and made it individual and it made it their own and then and they also pushed the evolution of the art form forward which is what i'm all about so i took that what they were doing and i got inspired by that and that those are the guys that really got me into the art form and and really sort of laid out the path that i was going to take with it um and then when i got into university um yeah, it kind of changed a little bit. You know, I, I went to UBC where the focus was, you know, largely uh, photography and things like that and conceptual art. And so um, I got into, you know, guys like, um, you know, I, I, I was looking at like at the time, you know, Brian Youngkin was just kind of coming onto the scene. I was still in school and, you know, was blown away by, you know, kind of the, the, t the way he approached the art. Um, and then I, I had the... Uh, I was fortunate enough to, to be taught um, in UB, at UBC by Ken Lum, and, and he, he, he and his work had a, a really big impact on, you know, what I was doing at the time. And so when I came out of school, I was, I was, you know, 
very in that mind frame, you know, when I was producing work. Yeah. Sure. And, uh, and so, I mean, <clears throat> you've sort of touched upon this, but you know, how, how do you, so it's sort of like, um, I don't know, like a chicken and egg question of, you know, how do you feel your art making deepens your understanding of your indigenous roots, but then also how, how your indigenous roots really feed your art making? Yeah, well, I'd say that like the art is the entrance to the culture for me. Um, and it's, you know, I, I practice the art daily. Uh, I'm, I'm, I do it daily. So, so it, it, it's, a, it's a way for me to be in touch with my culture like all the time on a daily basis. So um, a lot of the times, um, you know, like, like in, in growing up, I, I didn't grow up um, in my community. I grew up uh, outside of my community. I grew up in a community um, of largely, it was largely a white community. I mean, I, I think mm -hmm. like me and my brother and, you know, there was maybe a, a couple other native students in the school mm -hmm. uh, where I grew up. And so um, it, it, we, we didn't have like necessarily that tie to community and being around um, events and ceremony and stuff like that. Uh, so we had to kind of do it at distance and the connection that we had was through art and mm -hmm. it always has been through art and, uh, and family obviously, but, um, but art is, uh, has always been my connection and um, the, the native art, like it became, it, it really is like everything to me, you know, it, it's, it's the way that I live. It's the way that I, I, you know, put food on the table for my family. It, it really, um, it even surprised me how much it became just a really a, a seamless part of my life. Like, like I, when I look around, I see form line and everything that I see. And, and so, um, I can't speak the Helsic language, but I often say I can speak the language of form line and that I've studied a lot. So, right. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I wonder, <clears throat> you know, like how, how do you envision your work and, and then sort of in a, in a broader sense, indigenous art, you know, in the context of Canada as a, as a national political entity yes. as it exists, but also like how, how do you feel your, your indigenous like mode, way of being, way of creating maybe relates to other, others around the world? Well, uh, as far as like indigenous art goes and, and speaking of like, I can only, I can only, I can kind of speak of generally like where I live and, and the indigenous art that's going on here. And um, I'm just really excited about where it's going. I think like, you know, out here in British Columbia, we have, you know, many, many different cultures of indigenous people that live on the coast here. And now we're starting to see that all of these different cultures have different ways of expressing themselves through art. And then, it, and then on top of that, you've got like all of these individuals as artists. So, you know, um, when I look around now as a, like, okay, like when I looked around 10 years ago, there wasn't a lot of indigenous art, especially in, in, in contemporary art galleries in Vancouver, you know, there was a, you know, a couple names that we can think of. And, um, I remember going, going this way and thinking, um, cause I started out doing in the traditional native art market. And I, I remember going mm -hmm. this way and thinking like, my goal is to really just open this wide up for everyone. And, and I think that's probably the goal of everyone that came before me. But, but now when I look, I see like, you know, the variety of, of the work that's being produced is just mind blowing. And, and mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. I think, I think that, um, the, the rest of the world is just starting to realize the creative potential that the indigenous people of this region possess. And I think like, you know, it really, this is just the beginning. I think this is just the beginning, you know, um, I think that this is a, a great way for, for our people, my people to, uh, to make a living, to express themselves, to learn about their culture and to be happy with their culture and to be happy with themselves. I mean, I can't tell you like, I mean, I could do all sorts of different modes of art. I'm not just like a native artist. I could do realism. I could do whatever. But this makes me the most happy. And I don't know if that comes from, you know, something deep within that is just a genetic thing or what. But, 
but out of mm -hmm. any art form that I could have chose, I chose this one. <clears throat> yeah, well, sort of that idea of, of speaking a language that, that works for you, but also connects you to others. Yeah, uh, for it, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll add like one more point, I think, I, you know, to add on top of not only your art making and sort of you know, like within your community um, of, of creating those connections. But of course, you know, for people like me to, to be able to learn something about your culture through this contemporary visual art. I mean, I say yeah. all the time, contemporary art is, is the art of our time. And the our times includes anyone who's living now. That's right. Um, that's and, right. And, uh, and that's what that's what my ancestors were all about too. They were all mm -hmm. every, all of my ancestors. We call that like traditional art or artifact or whatever it whatever you label you want to put on it. But all of those guys were contemporary artists, and I really see myself right. as no different from them. Um, I'm just making art based upon. Uh, I'm, I'm using the form line. I'm using. Uh, symbology from my culture and uh, from uh, you know my my particular uh, cl uh, clan, but but you know beyond that, like I'm I'm totally you know in a world now where you know I'm confronted with automobiles and airplanes and computers and all of these things, so they play in too. Like it's not that you know I'm I'm not necessarily carving a mask and you know throwing a uh, you know Bluetooth headset upon it or something like that, but but the work is is completely and totally affected by the times that we live in just like you know uh you know an artist uh, from the past like uh sure. like Captain Carpenter or something like that who's a you know one of our uh um you know one of our artistic heroes as far as uh Helsic art goes sure and so of course I mean so part part of the part of the underpinning we'll say of tonight's conversation or this afternoon where you are is uh, is that you're? Uh, I mean, I'm super excited because I haven't seen any of this. Yeah. Uh, but you are you are having a new show opening there uh, in Vancouver at the Equinox Gallery. So big shout out yeah. to to Sophie and her colleagues for helping helping us, you know, connect and and coordinate this. Um, but I wonder. So some of the stuff that you're showing, I'm assuming, has been created during this pandemic. Yeah, and yeah, I wonder. Sure. I wonder how has working under these conditions maybe influenced your subjects or the media or your methods? Yeah, I, I, I've been thinking about that a lot. I've been asked that before. And, and uh, I, I don't yet know about the result. Like, I don't know yet. I think it'll take maybe a few years, uh, you know, to kind of look back on the work and see, you know, oh, you know, like, I was afraid or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. but um, as far as like the quarantine went, um, it went really well. And I produced a lot of work because um, it's kind of funny, but I, so when the NHL shut down, that was my signal to realize that this was legit. Like, you know, <laughs> I knew, I knew as soon as the NHL shut down that every Canadian male was going to go Oh shit! This is legit. This is really happening. <laughs> right. So I, I called my brother and I was like, "Yeah, we're going to be going into quarantine. I think you are too." And I said, uh, "Get a whole bunch of art supplies," and that's what I did. I told my wife to get a bunch of food, and which everyone did. We didn't do the toilet paper thing, but a lot of other people did. <laughs> and uh, and then I, I ordered a whole bunch of paint and I had a bunch of stretchers and I was ready to go. And then I literally just quarantined. I turned off all media, so we had no wow. media. And I've got two young kids, so I've got a three-year-old and a one-year-old. So it was just kind of uh, crazy bonkers around there anyways. And I, I managed to produce, I think, uh, six or seven paintings wow. in that time frame. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just very concentrated. And yeah, I mean, it's I like... I didn't even I, think about I think, the world outside. I didn't even think yeah, about I think, I Yeah, like, I think for all of us, we might have done better to like tune out for a little... <laughs> For a little bit yeah um I, I mean, as you were able I live to my life in that way anyways like you know like i i when i go into the studio like you know i'm a social kind of a guy when that when there's a show and an exhibition and then i go into the studio for for a long period of time like the last time i saw you was our toronto and that was uh, right. october of 2018 and yeah that's when i that's when i started this body of work Wow. So I went into the studio and I didn't leave until now. So, yeah. So, yeah. so I know like someone, someone put a comment about, uh, 
you know, they, they, they named the work, but you and I, we had a good laugh about where flipping the bird could potentially be installed. And, you know, I'm aware of, you know, the, the, uh, the totem pole you made out of like furry stuffed animals. Yeah, right. and, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so that question of like the, the political entering your work, but I'm really excited, uh, you know, on this occasion again of this, this show that you'll have at Equinox Gallery opens tomorrow. Maybe opens you'll give us some Saturday. Oh, Saturday, yeah, Saturday. Sure. Yeah. Uh, maybe you'll give us a little, a little bit of a sneak peek. Yes, I'm gonna try to flip this around here, and then uh, let's see here. All right, awesome. there we go. So, so the the show is comprised of uh, sculptures and paintings that I've made since uh, 2018, and uh, the sculptures, as you can see, here's one here, um, are made out of yellow cedar, and uh -huh. uh, they're carved, and they're meant to be viewed like completely around um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so uh carving I'll, I'll just say carving is is like mainly a subtractive process so you're starting with a block of wood and you're removing material uh to get at the uh the heart of or the essence of what you're you know, what you're trying to bring to life and mm -hmm. um when i quit carving to do a lot of painting um i painted with uh i think it was when i I, I stopped carving to go and work with Lawrence Paul. Um, so there's one of the paintings. Uh, let me yeah. just finish up about the carvings first. So um, yeah, yeah. when I went to work, work with Lawrence, I, I stopped painting, I uh, stopped carving and I just was painting and I thought, um, you know, I'm not going to go back to carving until I can figure out a different way of carving. I was bored of it. Um, I felt like, you know, I, I'd achieved a certain look and I could do certain things with it. And I wanted to try something different with carving to sort of, to, to push it forward. And my idea came when I started to think about assemblage. And so mm. it became not only a subtractive process, but an, an, an additive type process. And, and what ended up happening was I, I, instead of working on one piece at a time, I worked on several pieces at a time and um, use, so if I cut one face in half, I might use that other half of the face on another one of these faces. And mm. so, um, a lot of them have the same pieces borrowed throughout, or not borrowed throughout, but, but maybe one work will be existing on another work that is, you know, way over there. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. On the other so side of like, the gallery. Yeah, yeah, so it's like a, a fusion of... Yes, of yeah, yeah. And so we're, yeah, we're still nice. working on setting things up. This is one of the paintings, um, uh, the mask maker, this one's called. And these are um, my neo form line paintings. And so I'm, I'm taking form line, traditional form line, which is the black line in, in native art and really just um, using the characteristics and the rules and the historic principles of form line, but trying to like push them into new uh, sculptural, um, uh, you it, just trying to employ as as much as I can uh, different and new and interesting methods and uh, ways of like stretching and playing with the form line. This is another. Yeah, uh, I mean, in that in that grayscale painting, there's like quite a lot of volumetric shading, and I see that here yes. as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the form line is in, is is inherently flat. And so yeah, I yeah. wanted to take the, the nature of the form line, but then push it out into three dimension. So right. if you flatten these right out, they, they would look uh, closer to a traditional piece. Mm -hmm. I'll just, I'm on a rolling chair, so I'll be able to roll down this way. Oh, nice. <laughs> Another one here. So um, again, in, in talking about flatness, I'm playing with flatness here because there is no dimension to the background, but in, in leaving the background black like that, it, it kind of gives you uh, an infinite dimension uh, in right. many ways. Like it could go on and on and on forever. And so, you know, nighttime type scene. And, and then what I've done is in flatness, just by, by dropping the bird slightly lower, uh, create like a dynamic of, uh, you know, perspective and distance. But just right. constantly playing with flattening things out and giving things sculptural uh, sculpture and uh, a little bit of per perception as well. Yeah. Uh, let me slide over here. This is a uh, um, the bear transformation. Oh wow! 
So trying to depict transformations in, in different ways and shape shifting in different ways, not, not the traditional ways. A lot of times we use like mechanical pulleys and things like that to make things transform or um, mm -hmm. um, this, this is, uh, you know, I wanted to show, you know, the body of the bear in full form and then the face as well. And then yeah. you can see like little added things like um, little bear yeah, claw earrings feelings. and things like yeah. that. Yeah. And let's see what we got here. This one, I th oh. this one is called the Voices in My Head. You see, it's quite a kind of scary looking one, actually. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's got a lot of mouths on it. <clears throat> so, are there? I mean, are there in in Hiltzuk, um cosmology? Are there um, there are like the the good guys and the bad guys? Um, no. Are there? No. No, I wouldn't say that. No. And, and I, I also don't like rely mm -hmm. specifically like with these on Heltzik cosmo cosmology, uh, any mm. particular story. I'm more referring, I'm more just using the symbology to express um, less concept, more emotive type feeling. Um, okay. So, so my goal is is less less concept, more emotive, more 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 that. And and another thing about them too is if I zoom right in on here, you can see mm -hmm. that they're they're rough, and you can still mm -hmm. see the pencil mark marks on them and stuff. So so right. my thing was um, I, I had seen native art trend largely towards perfection, and 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 the the the, the carvers of the coast, you know. Are incredible carvers and their their ability to carve you know perfectly just it got better and better and better to the point where you know most of the work just looked to me it looked like almost too perfect and mm. and i was looking around on instagram and i noticed that like the work that i liked the most was was kind of like before they finished it so you would get these guys that would post like uh, sort of shots of them um, working on like the work, process. Like yeah. process shots, and I always loved the work before they finished it. And I thought, mm. well, well, maybe that's just what I need to do then. Maybe, maybe some, there's something magical in just leaving it unfinished, and 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 then you get this kind of idea of like uh, the piece still maintaining uh, potential energy, and and the energy just doesn't just sort of evaporate, leaving the room because the piece is so perfect and finished and. Uh, almost right. lifeless right the swiss one is a, a wolf transformation so you can see i've cut the face in half and this face uh the other side of this face actually ended up on the first one that i showed you oh, okay so the other side of that and then i recarved it a bit differently so you can see the wolf there and uh sorry the human form and the then human it form, right, the wolf, wolf here wow and then you can see you know a small little wolf figure here oh yeah and then a little Oh. humanoid wolf in there <laughs> right yeah so there are like these little little details that yeah yeah, yeah. i mean that's again like, as i told you the surrealism quite you know played quite quite into you know what I, what i was thinking and, and just like where i wanted to go with these so right. yeah that's that's basically wow that's basically the exhibition right there oh there's oh there is one more painting out here that i'll show you and this is the new Equinox Gallery space. And I, this is yeah. my first uh, exhibition with Equinox Gallery. And I'm like, really, really excited. Oh, great. Been working with them, you know, just in getting this exhibition together and uh, just love, love it here. So, so that oh, one nice. there, that'll be. Uh, oh. Wow. So this one, as you can see, on the left, you see the. The bird features. Yeah. Yes. You got the, uh, on, so this side. You got the eagle yeah. and then the raven and the oh, right. frog and then the the wing uh behind the ear and the wing behind the ear and then the the it's hard to do this talons talons and, yeah and then the tail feathers in behind here and then the whole thing right. just makes a face too with the eyes right. and the nose and the mouth so definitely transformation in numerous different ways right yes um i think it i think it's also it's a great a great uh last image to look at in the sense that you know you you are the creator of all of these um you know all of these faces i also thought it was really interesting to sort of the the first painting that you mentioned 
uh, that you showed was it's called the mask maker. Yeah, it's almost like you you are the mask maker. Indeed, yes. Um, yeah, that's that's definitely what it was about. Here's that one again. Well, awesome. Well, I am I am so uh, grateful to you uh, for your for your time, for your art, for sharing, um, for helping those of us who sadly will not be in Vancouver. Yeah, I wish uh, you guys could all be here. Have a sneak peek when when all this pandemic is over. I haven't been I, I've been to Vancouver a number of times, but not obviously not during this pandemic yeah but uh when all this is over i'm long overdue for a visit to vancouver um but uh thank you so much sean for your Thanks time for having me i really appreciate it um you know again a shout out to equinox gallery show opening on saturday yes um again thank you so much to sophie and her colleagues there uh for making all this possible and thank you to everyone on field trip for tuning in um we really really appreciate you our audience um, and just so everyone knows, our next field trip program will be uh, in November, on November 21st, uh, with Althea Thauberger, who is also based in Vancouver, in conversation with, I will say, a surprise for now. But uh, stay tuned. Uh, please visit thepowerplant.org for more information. And please, if you are anywhere near Vancouver, please go to the Equinox Gallery and see Sean's work in person. Thanks, Josh. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye for now. Bye.